so give us just a couple of minutes while folks find their way over here from the uh, um, other session track introductions. We'll be starting in just a minute. There we are. Okay, you can see us twice. This is Gabrielle and myself. You will know you are in the right room if you are expecting the medley track. I'm going to give us just a couple of minutes as they finish up in the NXT solutions track overview. People so excited learning about new APIs. What you'll find about the medley track is that our goal is to look at overview topics or topics that bridge or encompass a lot of different solutions, giving us new ways to think about how we're architecting solution, pondering questions like Dan Snyder is going to talk about soon, like what do you want to automate? What we should what should you leave up to a human to decide? That is the kind of topic we are going to be covering in the, uh, the medley track. I'm going to slide right into starting to do introductions and whatnot here and give you some context. I'm Catherine Hall. I am a product marketing manager from Blackbaud. I have been working for the last couple of years really helping to promote and champion uh, developer topics for NXT solutions and a broader view of um, kind of no-code, low-code developer solutions across Blackbaud. And I think we're finally gaining traction. There's a lot of excitement at this conference about this. Um, and I'm just going to be introducing some sessions. I also want to introduce you to Gabriela Zelaya, who is my co-host today. Gabriela, do you want to say a few words? Sure. Um, hi, I'm Gabriela. I'm actually quite new to the company, but um, in regards to Catherine, right? She has had so many experiences here. I'm actually new. I'm a project manager for the social good startup programs, and I feel really grateful and happy for you guys to learn about the new changes. I feel like this medley track will really get us on top of what is technology doing right now. Okay, and if you haven't already gotten an orientation to this, I just want to remind you the difference between the um, room chat and the direct chat if uh, you use the little chat windows, the little chat bubbles over on the right hand side of the screen, you can chat with anybody in the room or you can toggle to the direct view uh, to chat directly with folks. If you want to find uh, myself, Gabriella, any of the speakers at any time during the conference, you can search on them uh, by using the search bar, find their name and you can be transported directly to where they are. It's very Star Trek. Um, I've always wanted a transporter, and now I kind of have one. Okay, today's topic, as I promised, we are looking at big picture problems, challenges, and solutions based on people's experience. And our first speaker is going to be Dan Snyder, who is the Associate Director of Advancement Services at Bennington College. Dan was also the winner of our first Power Platform Community Award, which meant that he spent a lot of time working with a Blackboard developer, Ashley Moose, to develop an application based on his submission. Quick pitch for the community, uh, for the, the uh, community awards. You can put in an application. You'll find the link in the Blackboard Lounge. Put in an application. It takes you 90 seconds to record a little video saying what you would build if you have this support. And you two can do something like Dan uh, spend, was it 40 hours with a Blackboard developer uh, 
producing your application. So I am going to give you directly to Dan. After Dan finishes, we will have Ashley Smith from Children's Hospital Los Angeles talking about change management uh, and Jackie Huffman from Blackboard, but I will come back on or, and, and um, I Gabrielle will come back on to introduce them. So uh, Dan, I'm gonna let you take it away. I'm going to stop sharing here so Perfect. that you can give it a start. Stop sharing. Oh, I'm looking around for the stop sharing button. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we'll see, we'll see if we got this. So um, thank you for that introduction, uh, Catherine. And let me just see, make myself full screen here so I can actually see it. Um, yeah, thank you for that introduction. And as Catherine said, uh, I'm gonna title my talk is Robots and Relationships an automation story um, this isn't the right spot um, feel free to to duck out now and find where you want to be um, a little bit about myself if I can get my there we go um, so I uh, my beautiful wife and I live in my hometown I'm actually coming to you live from my childhood bedroom um, otherwise known as my work from home office. <laughs> um, I have three kids who are six, eight, and 10, and I have a couple degrees in communication. Um, the, my master's degree is in the incredibly nerdy rhetoric and the philosophy of communication. Um, I've been working at Bennington College for um, 11 years now, um, and I really have no formal training in, in technology. Um, and so they say that you know, mostly as a, a an encouragement to all of you who maybe are learning about the power plant for the first time or a little maybe intimidated, um, you too can do this. Um, and as Catherine said, I was uh, honored to be the winner of the Microsoft Power Platform Community Award. Um, so I'm going to talk about a project I completed uh, as part of that community award and um, along the way talk about knowing kind of when your automation needs a human um, and before i jump into that i'm gonna give a little bit of my story so i've been trying to automate tasks since um, about 2015 and i was really frustrated by repetitive formatting tasks um, and my boss my daughter would really give me trouble for it uh, but i mentioned this this um frustration to a friend of mine and he said oh why don't you just record a macro um so he showed me how to do that and um i started and my first macro that i started on was very basic i was just rearranging columns formatting um nothing all that complex but as i kept kind of editing and recording and learning about them they they became more and more complex uh, then in late 2017 and early 2018, uh, I started using Power BI. Uh, I found really the Power Query Editor um, in Power BI was much easier to use and, and manage editing. So if you wanted to change something um, in the steps, it was much easier to do. And while both macros and learning Power BI were, were really um, helpful and great time savers, each of them uh, had one downfall, and that was that they all still required human interaction, whether that was to run the macro, um, needing to export a list, or um, republish a report. I needed uh, a human being. So, but despite that fact, I felt that I was uh, pretty fancy, as, as evidenced by my pictures here. Um, and so in 2019, I wrote in my performance review, my goal is to automate myself out of my current position. And um, kind of looking back on that, it was not that I wanted to eliminate my job. I'm still happily in, uh, employed at Bennington, um, but I wanted to eliminate the mundane and kind of repetitive tasks that we had, um, and that sometimes could lead to errors. And so that, is really where we enter Power Automate. 
Um, I've been working with Power Automate for one and a half years or so now. Um, and similar to macros, I started small. I just started by saving emailed gift notifications for gift backup. It was something that took a lot of time as we had more, more and more online giving. Um, and so this saved and freed up a lot of our gift processors time by doing that. And with this saved time and, and other things that we did, you know, I've been able to both add new automations, um, but also improve upon ones that we already had uh, going on. But, you know, as I talk about automation in our office and, and people outside of my work workplace, sometimes I hear this sense of trepidation in their voices. They're kind of like, oh, no, um, are you going to take over my job? Uh, or the, the other one, are you going to change the way I do things? Uh, fear that that is pretty common probably whenever there's any change or, or anything different. And while I'm never trying to replace anyone, um, the story about change is not always the same. <laughs> uh, but the responses have really made me more aware, more cognizant of how these changes are presented and brought up the point that we need to understand how far automation can or should go. Uh, one example might be creating custom fields um, or adding a custom field to gifts uh, based on fun codes or, or other th things on a gift record. It's a great way to eliminate human error as part of gift processing and doesn't really require anything other than um, the robot, if you will. Uh, but a birthday process might be able to identify who of your top prospects has a birthday coming up. But at that point, you, you may need to hand that over to uh, one of your gift officers or your prospect managers who has a relationship with that constituent and is able to um, tailor that birthday, birthday message to them. And uh, to use my philosophy degree a little bit, as Martin Buber called it, it's finding that narrow ridge kind of where, where you are. Um, so talking a little bit about theory here, so let's get into the production. Um, and first, because this is a story, um, an automation story, let's meet our characters, uh, both the human and the robot. Uh, the human here is my colleague, Cindy Luce, who is the acting director of Vain Giving. And the robot, I'm gonna call my alter ego, click, click, the database superhero. Um, with some of my BBCon swag there. So Cindy um, was looking for help from for her team, and she is currently a team of one, actually. Um, and it's called their anniversary card process. And basically what we do is for Libunts and Cybunt ones, um, we like to send them a solicitation in the anniversary month of their last gift. It's just a little uh, kind of buck slip within an envelope that they can return. And she had a pretty manual process, as you can kind of see here. Um, whether it's updating and refreshing the queries, sending reminders, merging the reply devices and labels together. Um, this, this took a lot of her time. Um, and so this was the, the project that I chose to work on with Ashley. Um, and as we were talking through how we would handle this and, and take the manual piece out of the old process, um, we kind of discovered that there are really two tracks. There was one track that could really be for prospects who were not assigned. They didn't need anything other than, they didn't need more than the robot to do everything. But then there was the track of assigned prospects who needed just that little bit of manual review um, from gift officers to say, yay, go ahead and send this or, or don't. Um, and so I'm going to go in and kind of talk you, walk you through each process that we came up with. So first, the, the robot process. Um, 
we have the Q module. It's not necessary to, to do any of this, but we, we happen to have that. Uh, and so this process has very little human interaction. Um, so on the first of each month, uh, an export file is automatically generated through the Q module. It's then picked up. Um, it's sent to our SFTP folder, picked up from there, and, and plopped into SharePoint. Um, and that is used to merge the, uh, it's, it's uh, like I say, a buck slip, and it will have the constituents' information, some of their previous giving, um, and, and some other details on there. Um, the same file is also used to create the, the label uh, file. And then once those two files are created, it is emailed. To Cindy, and she or our student worker is able to just take those files, print the things off, and get them sent out. It's a very, um, very quick process. You know, doesn't doesn't take all that long. So the second process involves uh, humans. This is the process for those uh, assigned prospects. So the second part of the process. Um, actually ended up being two different flows. So in total, we created three flows um, to manage to, to take over this one process. Um, the first flow also runs at the first of each month and begins very similar to um, the flow I just described that's completely automated. Um, but in here, the queries only look for assigned prospects. Um, and here, the information is placed onto a SharePoint list um, rather than, than just a file. And that, after all the information is placed onto a list, an email is sent to the gift officers to say, hey, you've got some folks that you would be eligible to receive this anniversary card. Can you go in and review them? Um, right within this list, the SharePoint list, each prospect manager or gift officer can review um, their prospects and indicate right there, yes, send this, no, don't do anything. And because everyone um, needs a reminder now and again, after three days, they're sent a reminder if, if um, someone is still impending that they still have to review that information. So after they, they then get another seven days. So on the 10th of the month, uh, the secondary flow begins to run. And for any that the gift officer or prospect manager has indicated um, they would like sent on that SharePoint list, similar process. Both the anniversary cards and the labels are merged together. And an email is sent to Cindy, and she's able to have, she or her student worker are able to print that information out and ship them on their way. So this really, um, it's a process that's been working well for us for, for several months. Um, it just really gets that mix of certain ones we can just get right out the door and nobody needs to look at. But for those ones that need a little bit of human interaction, a little bit of review, um, all these, rev these uh, reminders and notifications are really handled within flow. It's not an additional task that somebody has to remember. So here's kind of, to, to summarize this a little bit, um, the old process had a lot of manual as the first, first word. Um, and this new process is mostly automated. There's still a little bit of manual. We have to change the dates. If somebody wants to tell me how a way I can do that in query without having to change the dates, I'm happy to hear it. Um, but this really has saved, saved us a lot of time and really helped out a team member um, who is vastly understaffed <laughs> as a team of one. Um, so as we get to wrapping up, um, there's one other piece here that I think I didn't expressly cover, and I, and I think it gets to that human uh, point as well. But it's really important to share your work and your skills. Um, I've greatly benefited from Heather 
and and her team you know taking the time to hold the accelerator course um, i benefited from other people sharing their flows in the template showcase um, and those who've answered my questions in the community um, and so in that vein um, there's a few things that i wanted to share with you towards the end um, my automation full -off. Start small, refine, share, or as my notes say, make it, break it, fix it. I think, you know, as Randy Deutsch said, um, but really just start with something small, get a quick win. Then you can build upon that. Um, I can tell you that there's plenty of flows that I've created and I go back to and either somebody said, hey, can it do this instead? Or um, I was only able to get a portion of it built and just go back and refine it. Um, and also, I went through um, my flow kind of quickly. And so there are going to be links uh, to both the anniversary card flow specifically, but also the back of the Power Platform template showcase. There's a whole lot of um, great materials there. And maybe it's just a starting point. Um, maybe you take one and, and your business case or your solution um, needs to be tweaked a little bit, but the bones of it are, are built there. Maybe you're a Google shop and it's built in Outlook. Um, that just, just take it and build from there. And I can assure you, if anybody else is like me, I'd be happy to have you tell me, hey, you can do this more efficiently um, and, and give me some tips on mine. So uh, despite myself, probably being a little bit more comfortable with robots. Um, I know I wouldn't be speaking with you today if it were not for the relationships I have with a lot of you as well, um, who've encouraged me along this journey. So thank you very much. And um, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen, but I will stick around, I think, if people have any specific questions. Yeah, I think you have at least one question that I see in the Q&A chat, and that is, do you always document the current process before creating a new automation? Um, yes and no. <laughs> um, I don't always. Um, some of them are some of them are very short, um, but this one because it was more complex, you know, and I'm not doing a maybe a fancy flow chart or anything like that. This was, frankly, I still have the paper on my desk, I think at work. Um, I just wrote it out. I talked with Cindy, my colleague and said, okay, there are certain things that I had a sense of, of like, okay, yes, I know at this point um, we can do these things. But then there are other questions I, I had to ask, um, ask other people for questions. Yeah. And just as a uh, side note to, to promote other sessions in this track, we will be digging deeper into this topic, especially when we get to the third session in this in this uh, today's session that is about business process improvement and uh, mapping out your changes and how to do it by one of our lean practitioners here at Blackbaud. And Hallie, um, yes. Well, well, it was too complicated to create in REXT in the sense that part of the, um, on the reply device, we have historical giving totals. Um, and to get those summary fields, it was just much easier to, to pull them directly out of, of database view. So that's, that is why we went, um, went that direction. Any questions? Do you have any questions directly? Let's see. I think I might have one direct question. Let me select. I was late joining, but how did you get comfortable with the flows? Do you have Do you have any background in programming? I love that question because I can say no, <laughs> not not whatsoever. Um, I you know I think. This is the beauty of Power Automate is really that we, you know, kind of as DBMs, as database managers, you really know your process. Um, and so you know the pieces um, that you need to build. And then 
as you go along, you can learn and 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 figure out, you know, I can really recommend the accelerator on demand courses. That's going to get you some of those basic pieces that you need to start and and then go into the community and you can um, you can see, you know, maybe somebody's already answered that question um, or just ask the question and there's bound to be somebody who knows um, who has an answer. So um, so the export to F F FTP automated or does it require manual push? It is automated for us because we have the Q module, um, but you could do it with a manual push and, and start your process um, and, and run through basically the same way if you wanted. Um, is it easier to work with NXT versus the data view when it comes to Power Automate or does it not matter? Um, so really the Power Automate connectors are all connected to NXT. Um, and that, you know, the, that API. So in that sense, you know, you're, you're always connected there. That does not mean though, however, as kind of shown in, in this, in the flow that you can't export data and put that someplace else to pick it up, um, and, and start from there, whether that's, you know, kind of a SharePoint list or an Excel, um, document, you know, some are a little easier to work with than others. SharePoint is easier to work with than an Excel doc. That's largely why we were in SharePoint um, with, with the flows. But hopefully that answers your question, Mark. So. Let's see, maybe I have another direct message. So we'll see if that's a question. Okay, yeah. So that was just a response to something I already mentioned so um and i don't know how we're we are with time we've got about another minute or two so we're scheduled till 1 15. if you want are, are you okay about people direct messaging you and oh yeah absolutely yep yeah and what's cool is you... say meet me in the blackboard lounge or uh, any of the lounges and you can have a conversation with them yeah, absolutely. If anybody has questions or wants to talk about it more, just send me a direct message and, and um, we can plan to meet up someplace within Spatial Chat. Yeah, kind of a fun thing about like if, if you're in the Blackboard Lounge, you can go off into one side and yep. have a private conversation. It doesn't have to be broadcast to everybody or with a big group. Yep, absolutely. <laughs> so. Nice. Thank you so much, Dan. This is fabulous. Thank you. And Tell me, are you submitting another idea? Uh, I've just focused on getting through this presentation first. So <laughs> <laughs> I, I haven't thought about it yet. Um, I'm, I might, but um, I've got to yeah. give it a little bit more thought. So <laughs> Yeah, I, I would encourage anybody else who wants to go through this process. Uh, yeah, may, that's another thing you can chat with Dan about is like, how did it work? Is it worth yeah. it? Um, yeah. So. Because if we think it's a pretty cool opportunity. We'd love for more people. It's, to it's great. Um, and, and definitely I picked up a few things, just certain steps that now I can use in other flows. Um, mm -hmm. So it's really helpful. Okay. So. Thank you, Dan. Thank you. And, yeah. And now Gabriela is going to Thank introduce you. us to our next speaker. Sure. After having this amazing um, information given to us from Dan, I would love for us to talk about like change. We know that business success is a harmony between people, process, and technology. So here with us today, we have Ashley Smith. She's the manager CRM and enterprise system delivery at Children's Hospital Los Angeles. She's going to really talk about change. So let's keep it up with that. Questions? Let's see, do we have, Ashley, are you, let's see, we got to promote you. You are promoted. Now you can take the stage. Ashley, you should see now at the bottom of your screen uh, stage or become a speaker. Yes. There you go. Nice to see you. Thank you. And you can hear me okay? Yes. Perfect. 
All right. Well, thank you, everybody, for joining me. I'm just going to get myself situated and my screen shared. And a question, do you see presenter view or the normal view? The normal view. Okay, perfect. Well, thank you so much. Thank you so much for that introduction and uh, good morning to my West Coast folks and good afternoon to my East Coast folks. Uh, my name is Ashley Smith and I'm going to lead this, this section today called People, Process, Technology, Navigating Development and Change Management in a Remote World. So just a little bit about me. I've been in various facets of process prospect project management for over 10 years and specifically on Blackbaud projects since 2014. Um, I'm the manager of CRM and enterprise system delivery at Children's Hospital Los Angeles and I live in Pasadena, California, just a couple of miles from the Rose Bowl for any football fans out there. And this past December, I successfully defended my dissertation titled Excelling in Telework, a Delphi Study and formally received a doctorate of education in organizational leadership. And also, which I know many of you can relate to in some way, the past couple of years were far less than normal. Uh, for me, that marks a very unexpected cancer diagnosis, but I'm proud to say that next month I'll be one year cancer free so I can continue to do what I love to do, which is cook and pretend that I host my own cooking show. So that's a little bit about me, and I hope to learn a little bit more about you during the session today and throughout the conference. So let's get started. Here's our agenda for today. Um, today I'm going to talk about change from a technical perspective and strategies to ensure that development work is efficient, effective, and built to scale. And additionally, I'll share some of my own research on virtual work and provide evidence-based tips on how to successfully navigate development and change in a remote world. So with that said, I invite you and really I challenge you to approach this session with what's called a beginner's mind. We're all human and when we have experience with a certain thing, we might tune out when that thing is discussed so even though you may have dealt with change or you've been a remote worker permanently, let's say, just continue to ask yourself, am I doing these things? Can I be doing them better? And for everyone on this call, I challenge you to walk away with a commitment to actionable activities and practices to be an architect of change, even in what for some can be a very challenging virtual environment. So we're going to warm up with a couple of polls and um, I cannot see the poll, it's the, the chat themselves. So if someone could help me read off uh, what's shared. But at any rate, um, let's start with the first poll. So who here likes change? So in the chat, rate yourself on a scale of one to 10, 10 being you love change, one being it's really not your thing. I'll go ahead and throw that in the chat and uh, we'll see, we'll get a pulse of how we feel. Okay, well, we are seeing a lot more toward the upper end of the scale. Uh, we've got a lot of, a lot of fives. It yeah, depends. and there's some fives. So when we started okay. out, the first responders were pretty, no, no, wait, it's, it's, you're right, it's a lot of fives. And it's then a lot of fives, yeah. Well, well, great. So, so there's there's diversity out there, which is which is great. <laughs> we, we don't have any ones or twos that I see. So it doesn't sound like we're anti-change, but we're maybe it depends on the change. To I love it. I'm very pro-change. Um, so so that's great, and that's as we'll learn. That's that's fair. That's normal. Don't be alarmed. Um, so as, as you think about how you like change or how you dislike change or how you're somewhere in the middle, one more kickoff poll. Think about your typical reactions to organizational change. So describe how you tend to react to it in, in one or two words. You can use this feeling chart if you prefer. Um, and then give us as, as many answers as you need to, because obviously there's more than one reaction to change. So go ahead and put those reactions to in the chat. Okay, we're getting uh, nervous, ex nervous and excited, nervous, a lot of nervouses. Quiet, contemplative. Some excited. Great, some cool. So we got a mix. 
interested. Okay. Yeah, some, there are some people who get excited by it and others more common that are annoyed, nervous, cautiously optimistic. Okay, great. Well, thank you. Thank you for sharing. I know um, it's, it's always a, a sign of vulnerability to share your feelings. So I really appreciate that. Um, so as now you think about, okay, how do I like change? How am I predisposed to change? And how do I react to it? Just sit your, situate yourself right there. Situate yourself in organizational change. Um, you know, we know that change is essentially moving from one state to another state. And the, the journey that we take from one state to another state helps us understand sort of the complexity of change when it comes to organizational change, because not all change is equal. And that could help us understand why some people say it depends. So completely fair. From a research perspective, folks generally agree that there are three types of organizational change, developmental change, transitional change, and transformational change. And here's visual representation that again shows you that not all change is the same. So on the left there, you have developmental change, which is growth focused and is essentially an improvement of an existing situation. Um, this is known as one of the quote unquote easier types of change. Um, and in, in a development world, this can include something like expanding a code table to meet your needs, or maybe a low impact, low risk upgrade that jazzes up application functionality. So it's typically not met with a ton of resistance. But the next two types of change are the most common experienced by technical teams. Much of our development work or our work as developers falls in either transitional change or transformational change. Transitional change, which some may know it as transactional change, is the implementation of a known new state with a transition phase in between. It can be met with more resistance than developmental change, but the phases of this change make it easier to digest, make it easier to swallow. So think of transitional change, you, they usually surface as workflow automations, where you're taking a manual process and you're automating it with technology, with some workflow in between while you set both of those processes up. So maybe that's implementing an integration tool to automate data flow, or it's centralizing your prospect assignment procedures directly within your CRM application. The third type of change, as the picture suggests, is the heaviest lift. It has the greater number of the greatest number of twists and turns and is has the largest number of unknowns. And this is transformational change. These types of changes are often the ones, um, you know, pardon, pardon the cliche here, but that when you turn over a rock, snakes come out. That they require a change in belief. They require a change in knowing what's possible and it they emerge into a new state over time. And in fact, true transformational change can take three to five years to implement. So take for instance, implementing a CRM system where all of your organizational silos have to stop playing in their own sandbox and work together. That's certainly a transformational change. It takes a long time. And as I'm sure some of us have experienced, this type of change is met with the greatest variety of reaction. So I've been on a number of projects as both project manager and a team member, and I can definitely say transformational change projects are by far the most complex. And from the technology side, um, you can kind of feel stuck. And I felt stuck because on the one hand, I have to be there. The technology needs the technologists to make it work. Uh, but then on the other side, the users of the technology, depending uh, again on how they react to change and specifically how they react to transformational change, um, you know, can tend to take it out on you when really they're just frustrated at the situation themselves. They're, they're uh, frustrated with the journey. Um, and as many of us know, the variety of reaction is vast, just like we shared here as a group. And depending on our predisposition to change, it can vary in intensity. So I was once on a project team to implement an undergraduate recruitment CRM and essentially move our entire enrollment division, which was pre-college programs, undergraduate admissions, and financial aid to a central application database. So in that example, purchasing the CRM would be considered the birth of that change. And we worked 
ad nauseum <laughs> to design it, which would be that growth phase um, illustrated here. And just like many projects, this one uh, certainly got to a design paralysis phase where, where we all kind of understand when it came into us, but came kind of just felt like everything was falling apart. It was chaos um, in some way, shape, and form throughout the pro project. So as we had to shift our thinking sort of one by one, so if, for example, shift our thinking as to, okay, how would paper applications work in a uh, virtual environment? And how would we automate that application reading process? Um, that chaos emerged into some wake up calls of, hey, you know, um, the process is different, but it's actually better. It's actually gonna be easier. We're not gonna have to carry suitcases of applications back and forth to read them. Now we just need a laptop. Um, so that's, you know, one example to show that the, that chaos after some change management went into it, um, turns into reemergence into a new state. And that new state, again, over time was actually use of the CRM application. So there's, a lot more color that I can give in that particular example, but for you know the, the purposes of time, I think you you catch the drift and you probably have experiences that you can relate to. Um, that essentially, unlike developmental change that I talked about, where the journey is smooth, transformational change can take us all over the place, and hence it's met with more diverse reaction. So change, change, change. Change is an organizational buzzword for sure. Um, you know, even our Dev Days conference is centralized around being an architect for change. Organizations are, I mean, sorry, our organizations are different, obviously, um, and the change that we are embarking upon can be different. Um, but from a national perspective, here's what or what uh, how organizations trend. So today's average organization report, reported in a national survey that it had undergone at least five transformational-like changes in the past three years. And of those organizations surveyed, three quarters plan to multiply those change efforts in the next three years. So remember what I said about transformational change. True transformational change can take three to five years to implement meaning that today's average quote unquote organization has steadily been in a state of transformative adjustments for a minute. And there's really no plan for that to let up for most of them. However, about half of change initiatives fail altogether. Only a third are a, are a clear success. So we're exhausted with change and we really don't do it well. And really, like I mentioned, there's no signal of the end of change. When are we going to be done changing? Most corporate leaders, about 90% of them, consider digital transformation a top priority. And they're planning to designate upwards of $1.7 trillion on these efforts. So that means that in general, the strategic direction of organizations today is going to put all of us directly in the middle of these changes as technologists. So yes, a lot of development work to come, but also a lot of change to navigate. In that same survey, organizational leaders agreed that mo in most cases, employees execute change versus executives or leadership teams. So knowing that change is hard and that it fails half the time, there's undoubtedly strategic appetite from the top to provide a pathway for employees to succeed if they want their change initiatives to succeed. And that's why change management is even a thing. So if you didn't already know, change management itself is a framework for managing the people side of change. It's meant to prepare, support, and equip people to drive change success. There's a number of change methodologies. You might be familiar with some of them, like ADCAR or AIM. But essentially, they're all intended to do the same thing, which is help change stick. So ultimately, one key takeaway here is that everyone has a role in change management, and therefore everyone has some responsibility here. So that includes any combination of a project team, an end user base, a decision making team, etc. Many organizations have change management consultants who, yes, help guide us through different frameworks, but the fuel to those frameworks are us, the people at the center of change 
driving organizational success. So that's not to say that all of us in the room today have to do everything, right? Project managers should still manage our projects. Developers should still focus on the technology, et cetera. Um, but maybe this illustration could help. I think of people, process, and technology as a well-oiled machine. And when it comes to change studies, really the consensus, consensus is that organizational harmony is achieved by that well-oiled machine of people, process, and technology. They influence each other just like the cogs of an engine. When the oil between them is smooth, all is okay. So think when you know that change management is solid, the cogs work well together. When that oily, that oily, when that oil is negatively impacted, think about just the absence of change management, let's say that. It's like adding water, and we all know that oil and water don't mix. That engine is not going to be smooth if you're, if you're not contributing oil to it. So a story for you. When COVID-19 was first introduced, CHLA was one organization where thankfully the community really showed up to support. So internally, we had to build that infrastructure to best support the community wanting to give. Um, so we stood up, let, uh, for instance, donation forms and information pages. So we um, you know, tended to the technology. We built reports and automated emails um, and made a process to fuel the process. And in order to keep, or, and we did all of those things to keep the people, the appropriate people informed. So we took care of our people. So even though the pieces of this were adjusted as time evolved, because obviously COVID continued and continues to evolve, ultimately everyone involved, the project managers, the people managers, the developers, the analysts, et cetera, played an important and very, um, very important role in successful change management. Not everyone involved did everything, but we all played a part. We were all oil to that engine. So although most of us may be directly contributing to the technology cog, a general awareness that our work impacts process like business workflows and people because they use the technology is our responsibility. It's something that we should think about. This awareness can surface in a number of change strategies like some that I've listed here, and I'm sure some that you can add to this list. So strategies like managing your own state, opting out of negativity, prioritizing data and facts, communication, et cetera, are all oil. Some of those negative reactions like gossip or negativity or some that were on a, a, a few slides ago are water. So therefore we can all be oil regardless of our role. All right, so reflect on what I've shared so far and let's do uh, one last poll. So how do the gears move at your organization? So in the chat, share with us which of these gears, people, process, technology, or maybe it's a combination of them, creates the most friction for you at your organization. Okay. see a lot of people, technology, it's a combo, technology and people. And it's a combo of both as well. And this is interesting, people not understanding process of technology. So oh, most great. of them are a combo. Great, it, as, as expected, I think um, we're, you know, in 2022, Technology is obviously here to stay. <laughs> um, everybody is, is going to be using technology. So no, you know, no longer are just IT departments using technology and everybody else is like on paper. We're all influencing each other, which makes a lot of sense why there's sometimes a disconnect between people and technology. Uh, and so how do we again feel oil into those cogs to make us all work together. It's gonna take a little bit of time, but that's where change management is so, so, so important. 
So um, keep that in mind. I know that obviously we're at a virtual conference, so everybody here is dealing with virtual work in some regard. Um, but I also wanted to share how all of this may be complicated or uncomplicated by remote work. So particularly for those who have transitioned in some way between traditional in-person offices to remote settings, or maybe you're a combination, you're a hybrid employee, Navigating development and change management in a remote environment can complicate can complicate things. So um, that disconnect between people and technology, it might be harder to fill it when you can't just jump over and maybe show somebody something. When you have to maybe arrange a virtual session to help bridge that gap. So I'm here to hopefully help uncomplicate those things, I hope, fingers crossed. Um, so I wanted to share my dissertation research with you on a few slides, uh, which focused on ex employee success in virtual work environments. So from a research perspective, the literature is very robust and focuses heavily on the benefits and challenges associated with adopting an alternative approach to the traditional in-person workplaces. And really remote work research started back in the 70s when NASA engineers began studying how it impacted traffic patterns. Obviously it's evolved since then. Um, and now a wealth of research has been published marking the benefits of virtual work, like its positive influence on job satisfaction, productivity and organizational performance, and even the challenges associated with it, like professional isolation, scheduling difficulties, and the nuances associated with managing remote workers. So yes, of course, there's challenges um, and they've been documented, but really the universe of remote work research is largely positive, even going so far to defend that companies experience negative outcomes when they fail to implement successful virtual teams. And pre-pandemic, the prevalence of remote work was on the rise as the number of employers who offered it, which was usually as a workplace benefit, grew three threefold between 1996 and 2016. So we're all very aware of by now that the pandemic accelerated the reach of remote work from an employee perspective, impacting about 60% of American workers in 2020 versus just 30% in 2016. And in fact, researchers believe that will level off at about 50% in a post-pandemic world, um, you know, if, if we ever get there, I suppose. And as a country, we're kind of in a gray area as discussions on if we should continue to allow employees to work remotely, um, continue to be in the balance of that workplace benefit and public health strategy. So the divide though between employers and employees is evident. So in a survey last year, 70% of employers reported that they want their employees back in the office, but only 18% of employees said they wanted to go. So in fact, I mean, sorry, however, only 18% of employees no, I'm all over the place. Um, sorry, 67% of employees, two thirds of employees feel that company culture will be the same or better in a virtual work environment. So um, I paint this picture because it seems the, the literature suggests that employees are fine working at home, but if we know that employees are the ones driving our changes, how do we set them up for success to ensure change initiatives um, you know, move towards the positive, they move, they track forward well, um, and that we don't allow sort of this physical distance to get in our way of that. So um, as we know for certain, we can't just say, you know, things were working necessarily working better when we were in person or let, you know, let's go back or let's continue to work remote and we don't need to do anything else. Uh, we need to be very intentional about what we're doing when it comes to approaching change management specifically if we're disconnected by physical space. So we know that even having the best technology to support remote teams is not enough. And knowing that change management is navigating the people side of change, we must be intentional, like I said, if we wanna achieve that harmony between people, process and technology. So in my study, I sought to gain an understanding of what it means to be intentional and in setting up employees for success in virtual work environments. And here were the most, the, the heavy hitters, transparent communication and feedback, psychological safety and trust, behavior modeling, strong interpersonal relationships, effective conflict resolution, and intentional celebration and recognition. 
And as you can see, and, no, and to no surprise, because again, change management is the people side of change, these su success factors are technology agnostic and independent. And there's certainly behaviors that both remote and non-remote teams can adopt. Regardless though, as technologists, these are skills that our teams can, can hone in on to help influence um, strong or successful change initiatives. So just a couple more slides here. Um, this is a very dull slide. Uh, this is the, the what those behaviors look like according to my research study. So as a secondary component of my study, I sought to identify actual practices to implement these strategies in virtual workplaces. And there's significant overlap. Um, you can read, this is just a snippet. There are about 60 behaviors listed. Um, this is an abbreviated version and I can get you the full list if you're interested in that. But some of the best practices that were mentioned several times were things like delivering on self accountability. Some of us may be on daily scrum calls that are promised to be 10 minutes long and are actually 10 minutes long. Um, but I've been on several, I'm sure you have two where they're much longer. I've been on some where they're an hour. And honestly, I can't tell you anything that was accomplished other than um, it was the easiest path to get the project team disengaged. Another important one is reinforcing safe spaces for discussion. I've been in rooms where the discussion was flowing and things were being accomplished. And I've been in other rooms where people were literally berating each other. In those rooms, I can tell you for certain, no one wants to speak up if they think someone else is just gonna jump down their throat. Some other best practices were acknowledging strong individual contributors. Um, something that's worked for me is we used to have a pink unicorn that would travel across desks uh, for the person who tested the most test scenarios the day before, or the week before. Uh, it was a little corny, but we all ended up really wanting that pink unicorn. And then of course, conflict mediation techniques. Um, you know, Storming out of a room, arguing is, you know, maybe slightly unprofessional, but also um, I've seen those are not helpful to your environment, uh, something to definitely stay away from. So like I mentioned, I can get you the full list, um, but I wanted to just share how I've seen them also surface in some of the best and worst projects I've been on. So what I've listed here are my favorite phrases I've heard during my tenure in project management, both good and bad. And of course, you don't have the context here of how these things came up, but I think you could kind of get the picture because not all success behaviors have to be verbal. They can surface in a variety of actions as well. Um, but here are just, here's just a few examples to illustrate what they can look like. Um, I'm not saying, my session is not meant to be like a what, what to say and what not to say in the workplace. Um, Cause even as you can see here, maybe some in the red, just reading them, you might think, well, that's not very professional. Um, but again, it illustrates that in change, maybe sometimes we don't act like ourselves. Um, maybe we react in ways that is uh, not the same as we would if we were in an instance where we're not in change. So my call to you is to be mindful of what you can do to incur or what you can encourage and say to ensure you're being a driver of change or oil to that engine versus a barrier to it. So where do we go from here? I kind of flew through the, the research. Um, I've only really scratched the surface when it comes to change. So there's there's probably hours that I could spend on this. I, I know I wrote several hundred pages on it. So happy to meet you in a, a different room if you're interested. But for, he, for now, here are the key takeaways. Start big picture and then really focus on reflecting on yourself and how you can drive change. So no doubt change is hard. It can be very painful and people react to it differently, but that's okay. When it comes to managing change though, we all play a part. So specific to us as technologists, um, encouraging a strong foundation for transparent communication and strong interpersonal relationships are two very simple strategies that can be that can help us be key drivers to successful change. And of course, when we cap, you know, dump on top of that remote work environments, all of these are all of these factors are at play, but we have to be more intentional about them. So before I leave you and before we get into questions and um, yeah, I think we have a few, time, a few moments for questions. 
um, I want to challenge us to take to take this opportunity as one to be accountable. So think about what I what I talked about when you already know of change in your projects in your organization. But how are you going to be an architect for change today? So write down one action, one behavior, one skill or combination of those um, of what you're going to implement and or work on when you log off today. And if you're comfortable, go ahead and put that in the chat as well as any questions that you may have. Thank you so much. I see lots of be patient, which honestly, um, and avoid negativity and as much as I know about change, and like I said, I wrote several hundred pages, I, I remind myself regularly, like, take a deep breath, be patient. <laughs> you got this. So I think that's very, very, very normal. And it doesn't mean that if you say, I want to practice patience, that, that we're all judging you and thinking uh, you're not a patient person. So we're all human. We all have those emotions. And thank you all for your um, your comments and your celebratory emojis. I don't number. Do you see how to stop sharing at the bottom? Oh, sorry. I'm sorry. There you, go. there you go. And there are a number of people asking for your slides. It's, and yes. we have planned to share the recording of the sessions, uh, but not necessarily the slides. I. If um, if it's easiest, I could put my my email address, and if you can just shoot me an email, and then I'll share them with you, just to ensure that you get them. I'm I'm very happy to do that. So I'm gonna okay. people can everything. direct direct message you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, that's perfect. Thank you so much. I think we have like another minute. But uh, it was very thought provoking. It really was. Thank you. I don't see any questions. So if you do have any questions, you reach out via email or LinkedIn or, or via spatial chat and um, we'll all be change architects together. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yes, Sounds indeed. great. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate all of the information. Thank you for making us think about the way we work with others, with technology. It was really enlightening, I would say. It was Thank great. you. Is it okay if I leave the stage now? Yeah, you can leave the sure. stage. You'll still see the chat um, and people can direct message you. And I would invite Jackie Huffman to come up on the stage. She is our next speaker starting in a minute. And Jackie, if you just, there you go. Down at the bottom of the screen, you got to take the stage and then um, share your presentation, I'll give you, as Jackie is getting her presentation loaded, give you just a little introduction. Jackie um, works in business process improvement at Blackboard, and she has been very instrumental, interestingly enough, in um, impacting our accelerator course that uh, we've been delivering for the last year and a half or so, and is now available as a recording uh, on demand because she uh, coached the uh, creators of the Accelerator course, And so her work has been influencing a whole generation of low code business leaders, many of whom are winning awards uh, for their business process changes. So uh, I think it's more than just a professional interest. I think Jackie does this avocationally. That's why she is here to share with us today. Uh, she also volunteers with nonprofit organization. She um, has a volunteer role at the Clearwater Marine Aquarium, which is the home to Winter the Dolphin from Dolphin Tales 1 and 2 movies. And Winter was there at the aquarium for 16 years, inspiring people to overcome life challenges. So um, looking forward to hearing from you, Jackie. Business process Great. Group. Thanks, Catherine. I am going to share the PowerPoint in full view, which means I'm going to lose the chat. Um, so 
just feel free to stop me if you see any questions in chat as we go along. And that is not liking this tab. Maybe it takes a minute. Let's see what you're seeing. Let me try it one more time. I'll give it just a second to resolve here. I'm seeing a black screen right now. I am too. We might have to go to the contingency plan of <laughs> having you share. I don't, we did this before. Mm -hmm. And I was also seeing your presentation, but not in presenter mode. I, yeah, that's what I was trying to change. Darn it. What happens if okay. looks like it's going to go there? And it doesn't. Right. And so I'm wondering if what other options we have. Technology is great when it works. Um, this is in Chrome, like we talked about. I wonder if I need to switch to Edge or if one of you can share the presentation. Uh, let me pull it up. Did you Teams it over to me? Let's see. Um, no, you emailed it over to me. Yeah. And it's in the PowerPoint. I apologize. Well, a couple things while we're going to try to solve this. Um, I will. I'll share it here. OK. Let me. And what happens if I, the other way I can do it is maybe I can just share it from my desktop. No, well, that doesn't seem to want to work either. Okay. Okay, I am going to share it. That will also allow you to see the Q&A. Yeah, that'll be great. So, um, my third screen. There we go. Uh, slideshow. And from current slide. Okay. You just nice. Yes. Yeah. So we'll just jump right past, uh, right into the agenda again. Um, appreciate the opportunity to chat with you all. Um, I have been helping uh, translate business user requirements to developers most of my career. And what we're going to talk about today is some techniques that will help you really sell the value of your. Uh, ideas on, on automation and process improvement even before you make any changes to code. So if you want to go to the agenda, we're going to talk about uh, documenting the current state before you make changes. And then I'm going to give you two techniques to uh, get to a future state and eliminate variation and waste in business processes. And this future state map uh, tagging on to the last presentation can be a great change management tool where you could actually show users what the new process might look like before you even uh, create that future state. And then the most important part is quantify that business impact that you're going to have by saving organizations time and money. And I'll show you a real simple technique for doing that because as we all know, money talks. So if we head on to the next couple slides and Catherine, you can jump right through the transition slides here to this quote. So we're going to start talking about the current state process, but I also wanted to introduce you to a few quality gurus that helped establish the discipline of Lean Six Sigma. And this is Edward Stemming, who said that if you can't describe what you're doing as a process, you don't know what you're doing. So I'm going to give you a technique today for process mapping, and allow, which will allow you to know what you're doing and describe the process. So if we go on here to the next slide, we're going to talk about the definition of business process. So just to make sure we're level setting in case you haven't taken the accelerator course, you would learn this in the accelerator course. But just as a quick reminder, a business process is a series of repeatable steps and activities 
that have a specific goal in mind because they will transform the inputs into outputs. So if you think of the fundraisers that you all might be working with, if their process is to ask for gifts and get those um, major gifts from donors, the inputs might be things like information about the constituent, their affinity for the nonprofit, uh, their past giving history. And the steps the fundraiser might go through would be um, doing that research first, uh, scheduling the appointment, having the meeting, documenting the outcome of the appointment, what the gift uh, amount was that they asked for, and then the outcome of that effort. So the outputs from that kind of experience would be the notes from the interview. Hopefully that gift uh, was, re was acquired as well. So the um, main thing to remember about a business process is it's repeatable. It's done over and over and over again, which as you are automating tasks, very similar situation, but we do want to think through what the current state is and try to improve it before we automate. So if we go on to the next slide here, just remember some um, characteristics of an efficient, lean business process. The first and most important thing is it has to deliver value for whoever's going to use that deliverable. By automating business processes, you are delivering value because you're freeing up time, but you wanna make sure that the end result of your automation is done correctly. It doesn't have any errors because those cause rework and can cause bad experiences for end users and your customers. Go on to the next slide here. This is a um, pretty common uh, terminology from Lean Six Sigma and how we think about work. And most all work can be categorized into one of these three areas. The work that we do is, um, the important work that we think is really valuable, we call value added. And those are the activities that actually contribute to the end result. So think about a report maybe that you're writing, um, the valuable data that goes into the report, the timing of when that report is delivered. Those would all be attributes of value added steps in building the report. On the opposite side of the spectrum are the non-value added activities, which are things that we've done in the process that maybe don't transform information. And in our Lean Six Sigma mindset, we're gonna to try to eliminate the non-value add tasks, also known as waste. I'm not gonna spend much time on the necessary non-value add, but those are sometimes requirements of systems or regulatory requirements. We go on to the next question here. So a little interaction in the work that you do, think of your daily work, think of the business processes you might be interested in automate. What percent of most business processes that involve people, process and technology, do you think are those value added steps? Give me a percent in the chat out of a hundred. What percent? And you, you can see the chat now, right, Jackie? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Good. Wow, I'm, I'm, that's impressive. I think some folks have maybe experienced this or else we're all pessimists. But if you go onto the next slide, most of you are pretty, pretty correct. It actually um, is only about 5% of work is value add. 95% of most of the work that we do really doesn't transform information and is not done correctly on the first try. Now, you might think that the idea would be to increase the value add. However, you won't get much productivity by doing that. The key to having efficient business processes, eliminate the waste, eliminate the red, shorten the red, 
in the business process. And I'm going to give you two techniques for how to do that. So if we move on here, um, I'm going to go through how to create the current state process map pretty quickly. I think this should be review for most of you. If not, there are lots of really good YouTube videos out on process mapping. Go ahead, Catherine. And there's um, the definition of a process map here again. It's a document that will describe the steps of the process from the inputs to the outputs and that end deliverable. And there are generally two types of process maps. One is the cross-functional process map. And the benefit for that map is it shows you who does the tasks, what either a role in the organization or what system. And then you can also use a simplified flow chart when you really don't have to worry about who does the task. So a flow chart would be great if it's something that maybe just one person is doing uh, within the process. Next slide. And this is an example of how simple a process map can be using just three symbols. Uh, the start and stops are the ovals and the square rectangular shapes are the actions, so the steps being taken either by people or systems. And then you use the yellow dia, uh, diamond shapes to indicate branching or a decision point that has a yes, no path. So I like to pose the decisions as a question and there should only be two branches, a yes path, no path. And the key is that the flow needs to terminate in the end. So pretty basic, but it's a great opportunity to document the current state. Now I'm gonna talk about how to facilitate this. And as I go through the next slide, think about in your organization, uh, which technique you might use. This is just a reminder on the tools and techniques PC uh, for uh, Visio, uh, and then Lucidchart is great for Mac users. In the middle, remember all the power, all the Office applications have workflow or flowchart icons. And then in the the olden days, back before COVID, when we were uh, still going into the office, we used to get together in a conference room and process map on the wall with chart paper, that process there on the wall is actually the RENXT implementation process back in about 2015 when we started looking at that. Um, so let's go on. And so in facilitating, think about which of these two uh, approaches might work better in your organization. You can share that in the chat. One way to develop a process map is just to get everybody in the swim lane together. If you have systems there, get the systems engineer or somebody that knows that process and that system together. And then you map it out together as a group. <clears throat> the benefit for doing a group workshop is that everybody gets to hear about the other functional uh, areas and what they do in the process. Oftentimes when I do this kind of workshop, it's the first time everybody in the swim lane ever got in the room together. Now, an alternative that may work better, especially if um, you're short on time, but in, and it's really hard to get the team together, you as the analyst can interview each person in the swim lane, ask them how they do their steps, and then document the process map, and then get the team together just to walk it and confirm that it works the way that everybody thinks it does. Now, once you have that basis of the current state process map, we can move on to some techniques to analyze that. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and skip some of the benefits because we'll talk about that as we go along things. So let's move on to the two areas that you might uh, use to help you improve the process. Again, we're doing these activities before we jump into uh, developing the future state. So the first one is um, eliminating variation. And if we see by this next quote, um, also another quote by uh, Deming, that uncontrolled variation is the enemy of quality. And a very basic definition of quality is it can be done correctly on the first try. The way to get the variation controlled 
is by standardizing. And so if we go to the next slide, one of the benefits of standardizing a workflow, that means the workflow is repeatable regardless of which person executes it. If you have a team of five fundraisers, but you want them to follow all of the same steps, we need to have a standard business flow. And documentation is critical, especially with your core business processes. Um, you know, during this time period now of the great recession, resignation, I should say, people have the ability to move to different jobs. And if you have key people in your organization that perform that task and you have no documentation, when they walk out the door, so does that tribal knowledge. So documenting business processes is critical. Um, if we go to the next slide, we can talk here about the process. So first I'm going to talk about standardizing content and then also standardizing the workflow. Now, um, I was asked to work with a group of renewal specialists and we send emails manually, just like many of your fundraisers may send emails manually. And I wanted to learn about both the process and what went into the email. So um, in my case, I interviewed four renewal specialists, one-on-one, -on -one, documented their process, and then to analyze it, I was able to compare uh, the different emails to see what the variation looked like just by counting the differences. And then I got the team together in a room and we standardized. We went through each aspect that was different and we got to consensus on how to standardize. If we go to the next slide. And interestingly enough, just at a glance, without even seeing the detail, you can see a couple of the emails have pricing boxes. Others are all text heavy. And if you go to the next slide, what was interesting, not a single subject line, greeting, or the way they signed the signature was the same, all different. Now, you may not think that's a big deal, but if you go to BBCon, attend any of the marketing um, sessions on how to have effective email campaigns, they have best practice research that tells you how important each component of an email is to get higher open rates. If we go to the next slide, um, what we were able to do is use technology here to develop a automated email template that did the mail merge with some key data points automatically. So I found a solution that was pretty much going to ensure that the majority of the email content was now going to be standardized. If we go into the next one here, so the very similar process now, if you're doing something that doesn't have an artifact like an email, but standardizing the business process flow. Again, um, one of the best practices for observing people is ask them to do a show and tell. If you can see them doing the work, it's much better than if they try to do it via recall. When people try to recall, they're going to miss steps. They're going to forget checklists or cheat sheets or other applications that they actually use. So have them do show and tell. Again, you can do it individual or in a group and take maps um, or take notes on the, the steps, create that process map. And then in this case, the difference is you're looking for which steps are the same and which steps are different. And I used a color coding process here. If it, everybody did it the same way, it was green. If there was uh, differences all the way across the board, then it became red. And if you'll go to the next slide. So once I was able to show the team the picture, they were really surprised at how different the variation was. So here you can see that we have just one task that was red. Everybody did it different. However, what I'll tell you about that red box is that was who the email was sent to. How did they find the contact to send the email to? 
that was a critical part of getting the information to the right person on the right time. So a huge issue with quality if we don't send the if information to the right person. So knowing everybody had different ways of looking for that contact was pretty surprising. Um, and then when I showed him this map, again, I got all the subject matter experts together and asked them to standardize. So as you look at the next screen, um, in more detail, I was able to show them exactly which part of the process was different. And then we tracked whether we were going to standardize each of those components, just simple yes, no. You can see here that only about a half of the current process was worth standardizing. Those no's were things that we could stop doing. And then in the next slide, you'll see um, some of the output. We'll go ahead and skip over that for time's sake right now. But here is um, kind of the fun part. Start to mark up your current state map with the steps you're going to eliminate. Put some notes on there about other techniques that you might use. And you notice there, we actually eliminated some, some steps that there was consistency on, but they still weren't value add. So there was no need to keep doing those actual steps. Now this kind of markup, once you clear the markups, you can create a nice clean future state map. And as I mentioned before, if you had the ability to work with your end users before you automate something and show them the future, maybe it'll take away some of that fear of change that the last speaker just spoke about. Now, let's go on to the last technique, which is really powerful, which is identifying the waste in business processes. So again, I've got one more quote here to share with you. And this is from Shigeo Shingo, who indicates that the most dangerous kind of waste is the waste we don't recognize. Well, guess what? The tool I've introduced you to today, the process map is brilliant for identifying waste. So another step here. So in this technique, what you'll want to do is document the current state, but just assume, put everything in red. The red is going to mean that it's a non-value add step. It's, it's waste. Just make that assumption, right? Because we know from the research, 95% of most processes are waste anyway. So start with them red. And then the end goal is to just identify which steps are truly value add so that when we do our improvement, we're gonna focus on the red steps. So as you go through the next slide, again, basic steps that I just talked you through here. The key part for this value add analysis is step two. In order to turn from red to green, the process step has to meet all three criteria. Ask yourself, does it transform information? Would the customer be willing to pay for it or expect it to be part of the deliverable? And can it be done correctly the first time? If not, if any one of those is no, then just leave it red. And then what you'll start to do is focus on the red and you're going to be questioning what can you do to eliminate the red steps? If any of you have a three-year-old at home, they have the best technique to use. Simply ask the question, why? Why do you do the step? Why do you do it this way? So it's so simple, a three-year-old could do it, but it is a very valuable step because often you're going to hear a lot of legacy reasons why people are doing the step they are doing it the way that they've done it in the past. And that can also be a good um, way to learn what you're going to have to manage in the change management of new processes. So if we move can on. Can, can yeah. I interrupt you with a question? When yeah. you mentioned the word customer, the customer ah. could have a variety of different definitions. Because Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, I work Intern with my internal customers are different staff and different teams at Blackbond. The fundraiser example I gave you, you could be working with the donor, which would be considered an external customer. 
So yes, good, great point that for sure um, we could be um, talking about internal or external customers. Yeah, great. Thank you, Catherine. We go on to the next step. Um, I'm going to just go over one of the two examples I have in here, but um, think about the automation of sending an acknowledgement letter. This is actually, I think, an activity that's done in the accelerator course. And in order for that process to be considered value add, the steps would be the customer gets their gift receipt because we know that, that your donors use that for taxes. And to be value add, it has to have the right uh, constituent name, the right date, the right gift amount. And it has to be timely with, that a donor needs to get it. Think about end of year giving with where they've got to have that dated uh, by December 31st. Um, so delivered in a timely manner. On the opposite side, any time the task is done that causes an error, so the gift amount is incorrect or the, they don't get the automated receipt, that would make the task be non-value add or considered waste because we're gonna to have to take extra time and effort to uh, fix that error. I'm gonna skip the next example and we'll move on to, um, you, you can load these all for me, Catherine. It's just some other questions here. You, you can again use this as a, a cheat sheet when you're doing that brainstorming of how to optimize you're really looking for um, steps you can take out of the process, whether it's for people or even for automation. Don't automate a bad process. Don't automate a process that has waste in it to begin with. Um, so just use this slide here as kind of your checklist when you're thinking about brainstorming and how to improve a process. We'll go on to the next slide. And again, um, the fun part, mark up that uh, current state with the steps you're going to take out, add any notes of how you might want to make changes. And then in this case, your future state process map will be color coded. So here you can see um, there were four non-value add steps and four uh, value add steps. So maybe we got the efficiency up to being about 50% value add at the end. Now, the last section is really important. And sometimes you need to make a case for why you need to improve a process. And again, if you can help your organizations quantify the time and money savings. So Phil Crosby here says, quality is free. It's not a gift, but it is free. <laughs> but it's the unquality things that are what costs money. If the process is done correctly on the first try, we don't have to do rework. As soon as we have to do rework, that costs time and money. So let's think about how we can take our um, lessons learned from current state to future state and now quantify those. So in the marked up version of the, the current state, while you have your subject matter experts, you can ask them to estimate how much time would it save us if we eliminated the items with the red circle. And um, in the renewal group that I was working with, we ultimately want to automate that whole process. So once I automate the whole process, I can remove 25 minutes from the renewal rep and give them more time to talk to customers rather than doing a manual process of sending an email. Now, once you can get the time savings, the next question to ask is how many? How many items does this process do in a year? And so again, maybe you can get a report of how many acknowledgement letters you did in a year and quantify that. I know that our renewals team actually does about 20,000 renewal notices a year. Okay, well, that's a lot of numbers, but let's go to the next slide and see how we can really quantify it. 
So now you can take the quantity times the time savings to get to an hour saved per year, which may not seem like a lot. You might say, well, 166 hours isn't that much. But I bet your organization would be delighted to have a gift of $4,000 that they could spend on their missions. Of course, I used our um, trustworthy Google research assistant to come up with some hourly rates there. So if all else fails, use Google rates to get some information. But if you actually can get management or HR to give you closer to the average rate of the workers that do that task, this can be very valuable. In the future, imagine the impact that we could say by not having people send a manual email, almost $250,000 saved by eliminating the task. Now, one thing to know about Lean Six Sigma, we're not trying to eliminate people's job, just like with automation. And I love that our first speaker, Dan, said that he wanted to try to eliminate himself from his job. What he really was saying is automate the mundane so he could go spend more time on value add tasks, right? And so that's what you're showing your organization, the value of what you can do. So again, just to summarize some of the key points, documenting the current state, using analysis techniques such as eliminating waste, standardizing, and getting to a future state where you can actually quantify the time savings before you implement it can be a great business tool to help you get the support you need in your organization. So um, with that, if we have time, I'm uh, take any questions. And again, I will also put my email in the chat in case you want to follow up and be happy to send the slides as well. Yeah, that's that's a fabulous idea because we do have a number of people who are asking for the slides. Uh, and some of them just made me, I had heart emoji, happy eyes. <laughs> some of those, I'm like, this explains so much. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, also, I know some people might be going to other sessions. If you would use the Slido poll to um, uh, respond, there is a post track survey that uh, let's see if I have it in my other in my other deck here. Uh, you can go to this survey and, and Jackie's going to stay on. I just want to put this for the people mm -hmm. who might um, you can go fill out this survey to give us some feedback on today's sessions in this medley room track. So Jackie, over to you for Q&A. And let's see. Yeah, so Julie's mentioning that the part is not knowing if a tech solution exact, exists to replace or remove one of the non-value add steps. And, you know, that's, that's a great point. And that's why I'm happy to be part of this Blackboard Developer Day so that you can start to learn some of the things that our partners have available um, and reaching out to your community uh, of folks here that can help um, answer that that question. I will tell you though, in most of the work I do, it's the people steps that we're actually able to eliminate and stop doing much faster than we can get the email automated. It was faster for me to change the business process than actually get the IT work done uh, because of competing priorities, obviously. But um, yeah, great point, um, but look to see where you can really remove the people processes, the people steps. Let's see, a lot of requests for the slides. I am going to put into, can I put your email into the chat, Jackie? Yeah, I did already. It's up above, oh, hopefully okay. right at the start. It's a little kind of to mark that and I'll grab um, before we wrap up, Catherine, I'll just grab a copy of the chat. Okay. So. Okay, good. 
Yeah, thank you. And did you ever use a process advisor for this? Ruben asks. Is that in the, I think that's in the Power Automate tool, if I um, remember correctly. And um, that would be a great question for Heather McLean um, uh, to ask. I have not worked with that, uh, but I think the Power Platform does take a look at your processes and recommend some that can be automated. And that is one of the things that Heather commented when we talked about your session is she said that she went through your, your Lean Sigma course right. and then took that to the uh, Power Platform Accelerator right. course. So everybody who's doing the Accelerator course is thinking through the before and after so that they're right. saving a tremendous amount of time doing the uh, uh, setting up Power Automator, Power Apps. Right. Yeah, and I hope that you will take the time to think about the time and savings and the money because that really helps your organizations understand the value that you bring to the table um, and the ideas that you have. Uh, trust me, people are always willing to tell you how to improve business processes. <laughs> Well, it also helps to justify a change in processes mm -hmm. if you can show how much the savings will change. Because as we were talking about in the previous session, the people, process, and technology, often people, it we have a lot of resistance to change and we don't always control other people in our organization. But if we can get on a common, a common goal or a common vision of, wow, we're going to save X amount by doing this, um, yeah. It, it, it does really, yeah, it does really help. And, and I love that Amy mentions that she did a, a process map before automating the email for gift notifications. And the, the other message, you know, I hope you pick up on today is don't just automate the current state if you can improve it before you automate it, right? Especially in large technology implementations like a, implementing a CRM really scrutinize the existing current state and improve it before you automate it or, mm -hmm. or move to a new platform for sure. Uh, and Jenny, yes, you will be have access to the recording later. And I think you already put in your email address to, to get the slides. So yeah, you can see the full presentation. I, I know in um, in my customer success days, I remember going into an organization where they were trying to automate their system, but they said, we make three copies of every check that comes in the door. Yeah. That was the first thing. It's like, how are we going to make three copies of every check? Yeah. And then, then we put it into the file folder here and then into the yeah. inbox there. And I was like, <laughs> <laughs> that's where you're talking about, not just automating the existing Absolutely. Software. Yeah. Don't automate non-value add tasks. <laughs> so. Okay, I think I am going to, do we, um, Gabriella and Jackie, do you know, do we go to half past here? Is that our schedule? Yeah, I think we might have run a little long even, so. Yeah, we did. I think we it did. was 3.15, if I'm not mistaken. Okay, I am going to stop the recording here.